Well, thank you, everyone, for um, coming on the call this morning. Um, just to give a, a, just a brief introduction, and I'll turn it over to Mike, and we'll go through the presentation here. Um, we're, um, we had a, uh, a regional labor council meeting the um, week before last and uh, had came to an agreement to uh, expand the impact-based warnings demonstration project to the rest of central region pending the uh, agreement from the local office lot. So what we wanted to do today is just give everyone a briefing about what this really is, what is impact-based warnings, and what we learned from the first year. So you'd have, uh, you know, information that you that your steward would, uh, would need to uh, make a decision locally for being in the impact-based warning demonstration uh, in year two. Uh, so that's just sort of a brief introduction here. Let me just turn it over to Mike Hudson, and we'll get started. We're going to tag team here, so he's going to do the first part, and I'll do the middle, and then he'll he'll finish it up as we go. So take it away, Mike. All right, thanks, Pete. Uh, just real quick out there, I know that one office had mentioned they couldn't see the screen. Uh, do you all, is there anyone out there that's not able to see a, a screen with five offices uh, highlighted in various shades of blue and the Weather Ready Nation logo on it? Okay. Silence means it's working good. So we'll go ahead and get started. And like Pete said, uh, the purpose of today's presentation is informational. Uh, we hope to be able, for those of you that are familiar who are, or who aren't familiar with impact-based warnings, you'll walk away from this understanding what the demo was, what we intend to do with it in 2013, and sort of the expectations that, uh, that your uh, um, office management and, and local steward will have as they go into their local office team meetings to discuss participation in the demo. Um, where IBW came about, as we like to call it, uh, it came about actually in the fall of 2011, and it came about in, in the aftermath of two service assessments. You know, oftentimes we talk about having service assessments, and we come up with actions that sometimes they get done, but they don't necessarily reach quite as far as maybe we intended those actions to reach. And, and as we sat and talked about some of the 2011 service assessments, and there's a lot of words on the screen here for you. What really kind of screamed out uh, to a, a number of folks, uh, both here at the region and across the region in various WFOs, is that we're doing a great job in issuing warnings. We're doing a great job of informing the public of when hazardous conditions are coming, but there just seems to be something that we're, we're not necessarily making that connection, especially on those really extreme events, either tornadic or flash flooding or severe or otherwise. And some of the things you see on here that we found uh, in both the Joplin Regional Service Assessment as well as the Southeast uh, United States Service Assessment after the Alabama tornadoes, that people are telling us that they need additional confirmation from additional sources, that there's a perception that the sirens go off often and uh, go off sometimes and, and nothing happens, that they're getting warnings from us that, that don't necessarily affect their area, that we still issue uh, an alert based upon a countywide system, both within our own systems and within the weather enterprise. And really the interesting thing that came out from talking to a number of folks was that when you know that something's going to be really bad, why don't you tell us that it's going to be really bad? What you tell us seems to be about the same thing you tell us when it's not so bad. That lack of enhanced wording during known significant events really kind of screamed out. And so in the fall of 2011, a group of folks sat down and started thinking about how we might tackle these types of challenges in our convective severe weather product suite, knowing that we really couldn't change the formats of anything, we couldn't change the approach of anything, we had to still be team players within the weather service and do what everybody else does, but how could we reformulate that message to make it more effective? And that's where, where IBW was born. And it actually was born out of, uh, of discussions with the Regional Labor Council and with a number of offices across the region. What IBW really is all about is risk communication. Uh, we're going to talk in a little bit about three areas that we evaluated IBW against here in 2012, but one of those was about communication of risk, that we know that there's a risk out there and how effectively we communicate that to our core partners, particularly in identifying clearly what the expected impacts are, not necessarily the phenomenon, hail or wind or tornado, but what's it going to mean to the community? What types of actions can they take to be more proactive in protecting their citizenry is really what this demo was all about. And we did it in two ways, and you'll see this in just a, a few moments on the coming slide. The first is the use of tags. And all of you out there as central region warning forecasters are familiar with the concept of tags at the bottom of severe thunderstorm warnings. We've been doing that now for about four or five years. 
uh, hail size and wind magnitude have been something we've flagged on there. And the notion of doing that, which came out of a NIAB idea, that new IDEA advisory board, uh, was to highlight what the forecaster believes is going to happen with the storm. It was communicating impact. And so we just kind of tagged along with that, no pun intended, to add these to the bottom of the warning to addi provide this additional information. We also added some text to highlight it within the context of what gets read on the weather radio and what somebody reads off of the weather wire uh, to make the information easier to find, and especially with respect to our core partners. When we formulated IBW, the question came up, who are you targeting this demonstration to? Who is this supposed to help? Most of the, the research that's been done by groups that, that look at social science issues or dissemination issues, a lot of your WCMs would probably uh, support the fact that when we issue a warning from a WFO and it goes out to the world, yes, they can access it directly, but most people do receive their information from an intermediary source. It's typically either coming from their broadcast meteorologist because they're watching television and, and capturing all of the, the news that's on there, or they're listening for those local signals like storm sirens or reverse 911 systems, something that happens locally that alerts them to the potential something is there. So when we, when we formulated the concept of the IBW demo in 2012, our focus was on the groups of emergency management and broadcast media, the, the partners that we have within the integrated warning team. Because if all three of us could utilize this new information and articulate it in as clear and as succinct a fashion as we could, that would ultimately help the public, both from a direct and an indirect reception of our information. So a lot of what we targeted to our, uh, our uh, uh, partners in this is really where we put a lot of focus on, on making sure they understood what it is we were trying to do and where to find this additional information. And as I mentioned, the whole impetus of, of, of IBW is the communication of risk. And this is a, a, a risk paradigm graphic that actually came from a, a National Research Council report back in 2009 titled Science and Decisions and how people take scientific information and relate it to things that they have to do. I um, want to spend just a moment here on the far left-hand side of the screen, kind of the pinkish or salmonish color area, which is typically where we, the Weather Service, have focused our attention for many, many years. We describe the hazard to the people that we want to warn. We tell them what's coming. Is it a severe thunderstorm or a tornado warning? Does it have large hail or, or damaging winds or the potential for a tornado? And we typically describe that hazard pretty well for folks. And we've done some work with impact assessment, but typically speaking in the short fuse warnings that I think if you recall as a warning forecaster putting things out, it's very hard to communicate within that product what you feel the impact of that is. By and large, those have been the conference calls we make to emergency managers before the storm arrives to the county or the webinars that we do the day before things happen. But in the warning itself, the people who are making those decisions that, that have you know, standard operating procedures that tie to the warning, there wasn't a whole heck of a lot of that. There was some, but not a whole lot. But the emergency manager or the person making a decision based upon your warning has to take the hazard description, the, what you think is the impact assessment, they couple that with their community's vulnerability assessments. All of that goes into characterizing risk, which then flows over to the right-hand side of the screen, which is risk management. Typically speaking, that's standard operating procedure in a city or a county. When you issue a warning, they have a policy that they have to execute, which has consequences of execution, all of which flows down to decisions and actions. Within IBW, we wanted to work very carefully on, on highlighting our ability to better communicate the impact assessment, couple that with some vulnerability assessment as well, uh, with some of the things that we loaded in, into some of the data sets of our IBW and demo offices, as an example, to, to see what's in the path of the storm. All of that helps us better characterize risk which helps make better decisions come out the other end. And as an aside, Pete and I were talking about this on Friday. Even within our little family in the Weather Service, we are emergency managers. We are managing risk. You as a warning forecaster are managing risk on every decision that you make. What you communicate, what type of warning you issue, how long ahead of the uh, environment, or how long ahead of the phenomenon you get that warning out, is all risk management for us as well. So this diagram really kind of fits us pretty well uh, in that degree as well. And so as we work to improve our risk characterization, we in turn are helping to improve our partners. On this slide, I want to spend just a little bit of time. Uh, this is about the last slide I'll talk to before Pete talks about some of the results that we found from what we did in year one of IBW. What you see in front of you is the heart of the IBW demo. 
and it does focus on the severe thunderstorm warning, the tornado warning, and the severe weather statement products that get issued out of WarnGen. There are uh, a few things over here on the right that I want to talk through. You can see a box that highlights here where the tags are at the bottom of a warning. And I want to talk, talk to these tags and talk to you about how they show up or don't show up when you're a warning forecaster. The first set of tags is simply a tag that indicates whether or not the tornado has been an observed phenomenon or if it's still a forecasted one. A lot of the social science input that we got into formulating IBW, and, and I think if you think about this from your context when you're a warning forecaster, you can certainly relate to the fact that a, a real threat certainly heightens the antenna, gets people paying a little bit closer attention to something that's going on. Doesn't mean that the forecasted phenomenon is not important, but when it becomes real, when that tornado is reported on the ground, it means something to decision makers. And we wanted to make that information as clear and as precise as we could. And so we introduced the concept of this tag, which will be present in every tornado warning, to simply indicate that to the decision maker. Is the tornado observed or is it not observed? Uh, we worked through a number of issues in our demo offices about how to characterize that within warnings. If you have a report and you don't get one after a while, that's all a part of our training package that, uh, that Pete will speak to here in, in a little bit, uh, or I will towards the end, uh, of the materials that we'll be providing to your offices to help make those distinctions because it's, it's something that's very important to our decision makers to know that that's there. The tornado damage threat tag, which is about the middle half of this uh, uh, colorful chart here, uh, is the piece of information that we introduced in IBW to allow you as a warning forecaster to communicate more of what you know about the environment, about the reports you're getting, and about all of the different vulnerability assessments and, and uh, risk characterizations that you can possibly communicate within the product to the decision maker, like the 911 dispatcher, like the sheriff's deputy, like the person at the fire department who's having to decide whether or not to activate the storm sirens in a county or a community. The, uh, the first option within the warning is to simply have no tornado damage threat tag whatsoever. And this would be and was within the 2012 demo uh, the majority of all the tornado warnings that were issued. Uh, it, it, it simply implies that, uh, as you can see from the words that are on the screen there, that you as a warning forecaster believe there's tornado damage possible within the warning polygon, but any tornado that forms based upon what you know of the environment, what you know of the storm, using your mesoscale analysis and all the tools that are available to you for storm diagnostics, tornadoes are probably going to be short-lived, which most are, uh, even in our region. And that if they occur, the preponderance of them probably aren't going to necessarily be the stronger variety. Now, they're not going to be the long-track supercell tornadoes that stay on the ground for 30, 40, 50 minutes at a time. Um, and, and the reason that we chose the option of no tag is that we couldn't think of a good way to describe in a tornado damage threat tag what it would mean uh, without diminishing the importance of the warning, because every tornado warning is important. But when it really ramps up on the days that, uh, to, to pull some uh, analogs out uh, to kind of demonstrate what we're getting at here, on days like March the 2nd of last year across Indiana and Kentucky, or on days like April the 14th of this year uh, in portions of Kansas, uh, days like uh, April of last year in the southeastern U.S., there are days when you sit down at the warning desk at the WFO and you know that today is a big day. Uh, you've been out looked in a moderate or a high risk. You're looking at your um, indices from the Storm Prediction Center's mesoscale analysis page, and you've got every indication that if storms form today, they're going to be big boys. They're going to produce the bigger tornadoes. They're going to produce the, the bigger hail, the more damaging winds. That's what the tornado damage threat tag is reserved for. And you can kind of see the words there for uh, considerable and catastrophic. And the difference between the two really is twofold. The first is uh, the catastrophic is, is completely isolated to what you would call the tornado emergency product. There has to be a tornado on the ground observed by spotters. It's exceedingly rare in use. That storm has to be moving towards a population center, some type of a town, some type of a city where there's imminent threat to life and property. Uh, and the tornado duration is expected to be long-lived. And, uh, and, uh, and then you're expecting perhaps the stronger type of tornado to form from it. Uh, the difference really between the, the catastrophic and the considerable is that the considerable is your tag to use if you believe the preponderance of evidence is there that this could happen, but you don't yet have a tornado on the ground 
or if it's happening in an area where maybe the population density is, is not quite as high. It's still an important thing to highlight, but it doesn't quite reach that, that magnitude of a May 3rd of 1999, um, where you had the tornado heading towards the Oklahoma City metro area. Um, both tags would be rare in use. Both really would be used on outbreak days. But the difference between the two, the catastrophic, is it's on the ground and it's heading towards a population center, and that's your tornado emergency. We really found in just talking with our five IBW offices and talking amongst ourselves that it really is beneficial to have that kind of a tight definition of how you use it because it makes that a very effective tool in your arsenal should you be faced with that type of a day. And so the tornado damage threat tag is your way as a warning forecaster to communicate more of what you know on those high-risk days when you know that the environment is quite favorable for the stronger varieties of tornadoes. And you really want to highlight to people that you should pay attention to all tornado warnings, but today, really pay attention because today is the day when lives could be on the line. The opposite side of that spectrum are those days where, and I, I can recall sitting as a warning forecaster in Pleasant Hill for many years, you get a squall line coming through and you're getting these uh, transient signatures along the squall line and, and you know that there's the potential, but you're just really not all that keen about whether or not a tornado is going to form within that. We introduced the concept of the tornado possible tag within the severe thunderstorm warning. And that's really sort of your bridge and your tool as a warning forecaster on the opposite end of the spectrum. If you're just not entirely certain that there's a great threat, but you sure want to make sure people know about it, it's there for you to use. And we actually had some offices in the IBW demo use it this year for just that purpose. There's potential, but your confidence isn't really that high enough. And one of the things that uh, I think is important to note in, in some of the focus group work that Pete will talk about here in just a few moments, our decision makers are able to use these tags, this, this spectrum of tags, as a way of inferring confidence. And confidence is one of those things that our emergency managers and broadcast media partners and the public really are looking for us, and we really don't have a great way of communicating in the standard product. It's typically on or it's off. We wanted to introduce a little bit of information there that helps people to realize just where in that spectrum it is and just how confident you are as a warning forecaster. The other part of it that I just want to briefly touch on is the area that you see highlighted in red. And this is information contained within the third bullet of the short fuse warning, and it has three sections, hazard, source, and impact. The hazard is a, a, a free-form way of describing what it is that the community is facing. The source is what's been reported by. Is it reported by spotters, emergency managers, law enforcement? Is it radar indicated? And then the impact statement, which is something that we worked very closely with some folks in the social science community to craft here for year one of IBW, and we're going to be looking to, to, uh, to retool here on a uh, labor management team for year two. How can we describe what we think might happen within the area that's under the gun of this particular storm? Because most people do take action based upon uh, what they remember of being through a situation like this before. If we can paint a picture for them that helps clarify the, the, the expected impact of this, it helps people make personal decisions on whether or not to seek shelter. So the two things that are really unique about IBW that you'll see as a participating office is the inclusion of these tags at the bottom of the, of the uh, warning, and then the text that occurs here in the third bullet of the warning. These impact statements that I'm showing you here are not the ones that we'll be using in year two, but I wanted to show them for you, uh, to you as information of what we used in year one to give you an idea of the type of delineation we tried to make between a 60 mile an hour severe thunderstorm warning and a, and a severe thunderstorm warning with 100 plus mile an hour winds. That significant flying and falling debris will prove deadly to those who don't seek shelter is a very bold statement, but how often do you get 100 mile an hour winds with a severe thunderstorm warning? Not that often. And so the idea here between the severe thunderstorm warning that you see now and these are the impact statements that we used in year one for the tornado warning, are just there as examples of what we tried to do and, and I think had good success in doing in year one of IBW. All of these impact statements are going to be retooled with a team that's, been, that's going to be put together uh, out of both uh, warning forecasters or bargaining unit employees in management. And the notion there is that we will come up with the ways of best describing what it is we intend to communicate when we pull those, those warnings out of both the, of the lower and higher magnitude to, again, paint the picture to people what to expect within the warning environment. So right now I want to transition this over to Pete because I think you now have an idea of what IBW is. 
we want to share a little bit about what we learned during year one so that you can understand what we, uh, what we came up with in, in coming up with this path forward. Thanks, Mike. And I just, just to add on uh, briefly about the impact statements, um, you know, basically, you know, we'll have, the, we'll have this uh, team looking at updating these uh, impact statements because we, you know, if you look closely at these slides later on, uh, you'll notice that uh, some of the, uh, we had some of our, you know, criteria kind of things in that, what size limbs would, would be blown down based on certain miles an hour on that. And certainly, I think uh, that could be, uh, that needs to be adjusted somewhat. We, we had uh, uh, ran, run these by a few social science folks, and they were focusing more on, you know, sort of the, the scripter of, you know, getting people to take action, and they weren't so concerned about some of the criteria that sort of that we had put in there. So I think what we're going to do is, you know, is, is look at updating that. For example, the 60-mile-an-hour thunderstorm wind, you know, had like one-inch one inch limbs, you know, down. And, and we don't even verify one-inch limbs. So, you know, there are certain things that we do need to adjust just this for. So we want to make sure, though, that we do pass this through the social scientists again before we implement it to make sure that they their input, you know, on, on how to properly word this after we adjust them is, is taken into account. Um, all right, so let me step forward here. Um, there's my email. There we go. I'm on the wrong screen. Okay. There we go. Okay, so during during the first year, I mean, we were working with a group called uh, we, uh, Weather for Emergency Management, uh, called Wexham, and uh, these folks are out of we're out of uh, North Carolina and I guess eventually Arizona as well. Um, the university researchers there there were uh, uh, they gave us insight into uh, how do we. Uh, tease out information from our partners uh, and helped us to validate uh, the project. Um, so this is the method that, that we brought into the project for, uh, for validation. And uh, it's basically a four-step iterative process where we, at first, uh, you know, we need to uh, baseline, um, you know, what current priority decisions are made with the, the warning team, uh, integrated warning team which includes, you know, the forecasters or the weather service, but uh, the media partners and the emergency managers. <clears throat> also needed to identify what the current practices was, understand, you know, how the knowledge is developed by the emergency management and how we deliver it, and what are the gaps, you know, and needs uh, in, in, in best communicating our information so that the public can take action. <clears throat> and, then, and then you go through an iterative prototyping stage where you develop multiple approaches. Um, and then validate the utility, test and evaluate that. So, uh, so we went through, we're, we're going through this process in year one, um, and we're looking at how, uh, you know, in, in basically into three areas of outcomes, the risk characterization, the risk communications, and, and risk management. And so like the first, in characterization of the risk, uh, we're looking for encapsulating the knowledge about the severe weather hazard, its impact, and its uh, risk to life and property. So you got you're describing what you know what the risk is and what what is the hazard and what is the potential impact. In risk communications, we're trying to how do we best package that information and deliver the uh, and, and deliver it to uh, those who need it so that they can understand the risk. And then in risk management, it's 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 the actions taken from the communication of the risk. Um, you know. <clears throat> What knowledge, you know, what's, what's the knowledge of risk influence that influences decisions uh, that need, uh, result in these desired actions that we want for people to get out of the way to protect their life. <clears throat> so um, so in, in, in working in those three outcomes there, uh, there was an awful lot of data collected. Um, we did, uh, well, first off, we had, we had, uh, you know, as, as usual, when you have some of these kinds of experiments, uh, the weather doesn't always cooperate. And we had a very quiet May uh, across eastern Kansas and Missouri. We had some severe weather in April. Uh, so we had a very limited number of events, uh, and, and the ones we did have were primarily in eastern Kansas uh, during, our, uh, during our severe weather season this year. So, uh, so that's, that kind of, we did collect, you know, Verification information on, on, what, on what was done there, but it, again, it was it wasn't the best year for um, for tornadoes in eastern Kansas. Um, 
we conducted focus groups prior to the launch. We, we launched this in April 1st on 2012 uh, across the five offices. And uh, so uh, focus groups were conducted in each of the CWAs with, uh, uh, with WCMs going out and getting a group and talking about what we're going to do, learning more from their needs. Uh, we did clicker and paper surveys from the Missouri and Kansas State Emergency Management Conferences. Uh, I'm not sure if everyone's aware of what a clicker survey is, but uh, it's pretty cool. You, you pass out these clickers to the audience, and you have a PowerPoint presentation, and you can actually embed questions in your PowerPoint, and they'll answer it on the in real time, and then the slide will update with the results, and it's pretty slick. Uh, so we use that to collect information and keep them engaged in our in our presentations at both of these conferences. We did a forecaster survey in August. Uh, we did internal and external focus groups meetings in August. We, uh, we actually had, in each CWA, uh, there, were, there were three hour focus group meetings with emergency managers, and then there was another three hour meeting with forecasters in these offices. And basically, we're trying to you know, learn, this is in August here, so we, the bulk of the, you know, the, the severe weather season really already occurred, and we're just trying to learn more about you know how did how uh, uh, you know how did they take the IBW from a from an internal and external perspective, and what are still all the needs and gaps that they would like to see? <clears throat> we also surveyed non-IBW offices uh, up, uh, up around the Great Lakes, and uh, and we did uh, emergency management surveys in October as well. There were really uh, I guess three. There were a few more uh, tornado events, but uh, they were weaker. But the three. Three notable or notable events that occurred were in uh, uh, you know April 14th outbreak, which was mostly in the, in the Wichita area and some uh, of the Topeka CWA. St. Louis uh, had an event on April 27th, and there was another event in, in the Wichita area in uh, uh, May 19th. On that, so those, <clears throat> so we have those data sets as well. So what did we learn, though? Uh, and again, um, from a verification standpoint. Um, you know, the data sample was very small. Basically, we're trying to look at um, did we have any skill in, you know, in those days, in those times when we used the uh, considerable, which we used to call significant, and we've changed that word for the 2013 year to uh, considerable because of feedback we got from our partners about the use of that word significant. But, but for, for the considerable and, and catastrophic tag usage, you know, what happened when we did that and, and how well, you know, was the forecaster able to identify, um, you know, on those days, you know, the outbreak days and the use of those tags, you know, what resulted when, when those tags for those warnings and what kind of tornadoes were actually surveyed in those warnings. And, um, you know, even though we're not trying to forecast an EF scale, when we use these tags, we're basically, you know, the, again, as Mike said, the use of these tags is, is really to try to show, um, you know, that we think this is a more a more important day, and these and these uh, storms are more likely to produce uh, stronger tornadoes or longer lived tornadoes than your generic, you know, I just hate to say generic tornado day. It's hard to distinguish these, but but you know, it's like every day. Uh, there are certain days, like like Mike mentioned, that you you know you come to work and you go, this is going to be a big day today, and we're going to have you know. We're going to have tornadoes, and and then when you're on the radar and you're issuing the warning, you're seeing the signatures that you know and the environment that supports that kind of a high-end um, a storm, supercellular storm that that could produce a long-lived tornado. And so, with your confidence in that, you can communicate that using the tag. And so, we've looked at you know how do they verify when that was done this last year? And you know again, the data sample was very small, so. Uh, but I think we learned enough. I think I think that there was an implied skill, um, you know, that when we did use these uh, considerable and, and catastrophic tags, the uh, the uh, verifying tornadoes of F2 or greater were, um, you know, had the same kind of skill level as we we have for issuing our regular tornado warning. So uh, without the tag, so uh, so that it basically. You know, it suggests that we do have this skill. We we do know on these days, you know, that that it's a, it's a more likely uh, scenario. You could have stronger tornadoes. 
but we do need to collect more data. I mean, if we're really going to do any kind of verification study, we have a, need a better sample. These big days are, are fairly rare, so, um, so we're really looking for um, expanding the number of offices involved in, in, in this coming year so that we can capture these larger scale events and we can better communicate our information to a broader area uh, from, from the uh, impact base format of the warning on that with the tags. So, you know, it, the, the early results support the need for increasing the sample size um, so we can do a, a more detailed analysis of this. In addition to uh, verification, we learned from uh, focus group meetings and surveys and, and talking to our partners that uh, there are really uh, six key areas of information that they're looking for in, uh, you know, in a warning situation or in our, in our actual warning products. And I um, just want to go down these, uh, these six uh, things, the, the threat and, uh, and magnitude, um, you know, basically they're, um, you know, what we'll do this year in, in trying to highlight these six items, um, you know, kind of, there's the threat and magnitude, there's the timing of the, uh, of the event, and we, you know, when will it get here, location, duration, history, and confidence. Like threat and magnitude, we'll, we're basically going to, you know, use the, uh, the tag usage and improve our impact statements to, uh, to better describe, you know, the, what the threat is and how strong, you know, and so using a considerable or, or catastrophic kind of is, is implying a, a stronger magnitude threat. Um, the timing, um, we're going to promote the use of the pathcast uh, with accurate tracking of the threat uh, feature when feasible. If you're if you're tracking a uh, a feature, a, a, a an impact feature like a tornado or where you think the tornado is would be in in the uh, um, in the signatures you're getting from the radar, like supercellular hook or whatever, or you have a circulation. Uh, and you want to track track that circulation. We we want to track that feature and then use the pathcast, and the pathcast will give a time of arrival information, but the uh, the wording will be in a fuzzy format. It, it will say you know near this town instead of being at this town and that kind of thing. So the emergency manager strongly you know strong feedback was if you know if you don't tell us when it's going to get here, I'm going to go look for that information from somewhere else. So we they really wanted a, a sort of a fuzzy first guess from us uh, if we could provide it. So if you're tracking a feature, like, like where the circulation center is, uh, where the, uh, the impact-based feature, weather feature is, then use the pathcast and, and provide that timing information. If you're just tracking the centroid of a storm, uh, you know, you don't have real good confidence about where exactly the, the uh, impacts are. Uh, then don't use the pathcast feature, but use you know counties in the in the polygon type of feature, like not counties, the cities in the polygon polygon feature. But uh, I think we have the option to use this pathcast, and we should use it when we are really really tracking something significant. Um, the location information, um, basically, you know, again, focusing on the location of the main thread and not necessarily the storm centroid. When when you know it, when you know where it is, you know, use that as the location point. Your warning. The duration is, uh, you know, we can focus on improving clearing behind the threat uh, in, the, in the SBS product. Um, history, use of spotter reports, uh, you know, and, and in the warnings versus uh, radar indicated. If you have the reports, uh, you know, that certainly the, one of the interesting things that we learned as well about, about whether it's observed or radar indicated, the, the observed uh, wording tag really uh, is treated a lot more uh, important than the radar indicated. I think we issue a lot of radar indicated warnings. Uh, and so the emergency manager said when they, when they see that, they're still looking for more validation about is it real, you know, is it on the ground, is it really going to happen, uh, versus when we say it's, it's observed, the spotter sees it. And so, uh, so having a history, you know, in uh, providing that history in the warnings, and the statements really helps the emergency manager understand the urgency of the situation and, and to, uh, you know, get their process in, uh, going. And then uh, confidence is, a, is uh, really implied in the tag usage, uh, but it's also communicated in, in chat room and uh, webinars. Uh, we did hear from emergency managers that whether or not, they didn't, not so much 
what was said on the webinar, but the fact that you're holding one ahead of a situation really ramped up their uh, level of uh, concern about about the situation. So, you know, certainly we don't want to have a webinar every day, but but when you when you have these special webinars where you're looking at more uh, more of a an outbreak day or or more you know concentrated time when when tornadoes are expected, then they really pay attention to that, even if they can't attend it. Just that knowing that the webinar was, was provided tells them that there's a more important day going on. So we can, we can uh, communicate confidence in multiple ways. In our products, it will be, be through the tags, but we also do it in chat and, and webinars type thing. <clears throat> also, the, our, this group, Wexham Group, uh, has developed an independent validation of uh, matrix, um, basically using these six key areas and then, and then mapping them against those three outcomes that we talked about earlier, which was the, uh, um, the exact uh, direct wording, but I showed you those three circles earlier, the uh, risk characterization, uh, risk communication, and risk management uh, outcomes. So um, uh, so they're, they're finalizing their report. The report will be finished at the end of this month uh, and provided to us. So we're planning to, uh, we'll summarize the report uh, and also, I think, Probably sometime in January or so, we'll do another another briefing for everyone, uh, just so that we can you can see the summary of the report and some of the findings that they had as well. A lot of them I'm already presenting here. Okay, so um, I'm going to pass it back over to Mike right now, and we'll talk about what uh, how we're going to implement this in in 2013 across your area. All right, what everyone's been looking forward to. What uh, what we've got in mind for 2013, we really thought it was important to share with all of you, though, the extent of work that went into IBW and the extent of independent validation and verification. Somebody from outside the Weather Service coming in and trying to help us craft these messages and, and those six key areas, being as effective as we can, knowing that we can't completely revolutionize the warning process, but we can add value to it. Here's what we've got in mind for 2013. As Pete mentioned, um, with, uh, with the report coming out uh, here by the end of this month and, 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 and with all the lessons that we've been talking with Wexham already, we've decided to make a few uh, changes to what we did in IBW in year one. The considerable tag versus the significant is one. And then the notion of, of utilizing the pathcast a little bit more aggressively for distinct features because that timing is one of those key pieces that every one of our focus groups told us to go to. Um, aside from that, a lot of the tweaks are, are very, very minor. Uh, from what we ran in 2012. What we have for every office that chooses to participate in IBW is we have three real key things to offer. Uh, the first, and this is probably geared more towards your WCM and your outreach teams, is a marketing plan. It's important to get out and tell people what it is you're trying to do in terms of improving uh, the amount of, of, of those six areas of information that you're providing to decision makers. And so the three-tiered approach, which really kind of, again, focuses on the, the trifecta and then the integrated warning team, your EMs, your broadcast media, uh, and, uh, and weather service, but is also important to note to the public. Uh, we have uh, put together for you, there's a marketing toolkit, which each office that participates will get from Central Region that we developed last year. It has a one-pager that you can put out on Facebook and Twitter and on your websites, PDF file. Uh, there are also briefing slides that can be introduced into all of your public outreach this spring, your spotter talks, your school talks, uh, your public safety briefings that you do. And there is a, a video briefing resource as well, a, a recorded multimedia weather briefing. Uh, all of that will be refreshed here within the next few weeks and, and put together for you to have. Uh, if your office participates and you decide you want to do a kickoff press conference uh, or do something within your CWA to really get the media interested, uh, Central Region Headquarters and our Public Affairs Specialist here, Pat Slattery, we're, we stand by to help with that. I will tell you that in year one of IBW, we got coverage from the Weather Channel, from CBS, from NBC, from ABC, uh, from CNN. There was a lot of interest in it. And that interest alone helps you with your goal of building a Weather Ready Nation in your CWA because it gets people starting to talk about how we can better communicate these types of events in your area. But the marketing plan will come to you fully delivered, uh, plug and play essentially for what you have to do here this spring. The other side, of course, of this is, is the internal side and how we get at uh, training all of you as warning forecasters to work within the IBW framework. We had a training plan that we used last year that we're going to use again this year, and it really focused on two key areas. 
The first, for lack of a better term, is polygonology. How we draw our boxes. Uh, Re-emphasizing what it is that you warn when you warn certain areas and, and, and knowing that we still have to be mindful of the fact that we draw storm-based warnings in an area of county-based dissemination. We did this last year in our five IBW offices, and it was a really good and, and important part of the training plan. But understanding how to edit the polygon, how to set yourself up for success, but then also building confidence and using the tags. What does it mean when you have a considerable tag or a, a catastrophic tag or using the tornado possible tag within the severe thunderstorm warning? Understanding those and how to use them we infused that last year into the West training scenarios at all five IBW offices, and for all of you this spring, the same thing. Getting back to some of the basics of, of knowing your storm environment, knowing your conceptual models, knowing what data and tools you have to bring in to help you formulate what it is you think the storm will actually do. Coupling that with polygonology really strengthens the, uh, the training approach that goes into issuing these IBW warnings. Um, and then, of course, just having the chance to sit down at the West and look at some cases that have those areas of gray, because warning forecasting is always about areas of gray. Uh, there is no right or wrong answer, but what we can do is we can let people know more of what we know and also more of what we don't know when we put these warning products out. The third piece of this, of course, is the, is the key piece of logistics. What do we get and how are we going to make this work in my AWIPS? Uh, we have been very blessed to have a, a, a Central Region WarnGen team that has produced WarnGen templates both for AWIPS 1 and for AWIPS 2, uh, and those are, are going to be available for your office to bring in and put on your WEFs for an AWIPS 1 site, for an AWIPS 2 site. We're still working on exactly how one does some of that customization and tweaking work because we're waiting for the West 2 bridge to come in uh, here in January. But the bottom line is that if you just wanted to load these things in your AWIPS 1 system or AWIPS 2 and just load and go, you can do that. Everything is there. But we know that there's some customization work that has to take place in many offices. You've used highway mile markers or local landmarks, state parks, things that you want to have. So there's plenty of room to do that type of customization work, although I think you'll find that the customization work will be a lot more streamlined and won't take you near as long to accomplish. Um, a lot of the customization that we found in the IBW demo year one fell within the fourth bullet. How do we list the cities? How do we list the locations? Our Central Region Warren Gen team has provided a multitude of ways that you can do that, from an alphabetical listing to a, a time of arrival. The pathcast wording that's built in within the IBW templates contains the, what I guess you could call fuzzy wording. It lists a city in an around time because we all know that there are some issues with being too precise and we want to make it to where when, when uh, you, you do utilize the pathcast that you get wording that says the tornado will be around, it'll be near uh, Des Moines around 4.45 p.m. The around implies some ambiguity. It gives the emergency manager and the person the ability to make good risk-based decisions. It doesn't say it'll be six miles southwest of Keeneville at 4.45 p.m., which is a little bit too precise for what we have as far as our data sets. Um, You'll have that to throw onto the West. You'll be able to use that for training and configuration work while also going to provide you a, an override file for NWR waves. It's a, a, a phrase replace uh, file. It has some entries in it that you can put in that will improve the reading of IBW warnings on weather radio. And we worked very closely to make sure that that was not a piece we overlooked in year one. So that will be another piece that you'll get, and it will be load and go. Basically, what we're trying to tell you is that from year one and from the five offices that have paved the, uh, the road ahead of, of all of you considering to join uh, this uh, initiative, a lot of this work has been done for you. And a lot of this will not take a tremendous amount of effort to get going in your office. The emphasis you'll have is on training. The emphasis you'll have is on outreach. And what you get to bring up all the logistics to make things work will pretty much be load and go with just a nominal amount of work that will be required by your Warren Gen focal point to make it happen. And again, why we're doing this is for all the reasons that you see here on the screen in front of you. But the most important part here is it's all about improving our communication of critical information. All of you that are out there as warning forecasters know that there are certain days that come with a little bit higher tension, a little bit higher confidence, a little bit higher risk than others. And what we're trying to do within IBW is to give you all the toolkit to provide that information to that last mile decision maker, that 911 dispatcher, that sheriff's deputy, that person sitting at the fire department, 
who didn't have the benefit of maybe sitting in on your webinar, who didn't have the benefit of talking to your county or city emergency manager, but is simply trying to follow standard operating procedures and do what they think they can do to highlight the threat in their community, or your broadcast meteorologist who's really looking to separate the wheat from the chaff and really highlight the storm that you, as a warning forecaster at the Weather Service, think is the most important one at that particular moment. IBW gave us those tools in year one. We're very confident that we'll have those tools in year two. And as Pete mentioned, you know, when we look at all the offices that participated uh, within, within respect to, of the area, uh, we started off with five. We'd really like to see all 38 offices participating here uh, in the coming year to allow us to bring these service benefits to all of our customers that exist out there. Uh, your next steps in your offices will be to take the information you've seen in today's webinar. Uh, if you know warning forecasters that work in those original five offices, reach out to them and ask them some questions of what they thought. Provide good feedback to your steward of, of what you believe uh, is, a, is, a, is the cost-benefit uh, analysis of participating and not participating. And again, these webinars are something that we'll be looking, or the webinars, these, these lot meetings are something that we'll be looking for offices to have conducted here preferably by the end of the year, uh, although a couple offices have indicated they might not be able to get to this until that very first week of January. Our important piece here from region is that we want to make sure we're working within the system of change notification uh, so that the partners get ample notification to make the changes that they need to make to make sure they can take, care, uh, take advantage of all of the benefits that an IBW warning has to bring them, including the tags and those impact statements. So with that said, we've done an awful lot of talking. We want to do some listening. So we just want to open the floor here. Uh, here in the room, we've got Pete and myself, as well as Kim Rump, our services chief. We've got Wendy Pearson from our hydro program and Jim Keeney from our uh, um, weather and severe weather uh, uh, programs here. Uh, we're happy to listen to any questions that you all have that you might want to ask at this time about IBW. Yeah, hey, Mike, this is Martin. The First of all, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that, Martin Lee. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that at the end there, that... This is done through the local office team process. If an office feels ready to implement, uh, that they have until uh, the end of the month, or, or at least we've got to get it done before the 90-day notice. But the key point is I want to make sure they, they have an option to opt out this year for the second-year test is what I understand. Right. Yeah, the option is, is, is for the local office teams to decide. Um, certainly, we'd like to encourage you to look at, at all of you out there to look at this from the standpoint of the value that you can add uh, to your decision makers, to your customers, uh, and look at it from that standpoint. And, and really have been trying to emphasize to all of you that we've done an awful lot of work uh, in the five IBW offices and through the Regional Labor Council. We've done an awful lot of work to lay the pavement down for you to make it, make it a very easy program to participate in. So definitely want to make sure that you, you know all of that information. And Martin, very excellent point. And it's been a real blessing to have worked this through the Regional Labor Council uh, in both years, in year one and year two. Yeah, Martin, I just want to say, too, uh, if you find, I mean, if there's a, a steward or an office that has questions or concerns, uh, you know, and would like to ask you know, me or Mike or, or anyone up here about, about that, you know, we could probably answer questions we just want to make sure that we, everyone has, you know, has the right information when they're making their decision. And if so, if there are any questions, really forward them up to us, or or you can ask us directly from the offices. Um, you know, it it would be nice if we had all the offices involved. Again, we'll, we'll leave it, you know, through the lot process here. But um, one of my concerns is that we might end up with a patchwork if if you know certain key offices uh, decide not to participate. I'd like to I'd like to help discuss that if, if you don't want to participate and see what the issues are. Uh, but again, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll go through that lot process. <clears throat> okay, okay. And keep in mind it might be a, might be a year with not too many tornadoes anyway, but well, well we never know about that, so. That's right. Anyway, we just don't know. All right. That's right. I guess I'll leave the floor open for people to bring up any concerns and, and that, so. And thanks, Martin. I, I'm going to have to, okay, I have to go here in about 10 minutes, so I'll okay. hang on for a little bit. Anybody else have questions? This is Barb in Omaha. Indianapolis. Uh, I'd just like to know how long do you think it will be before you have us available as a recording? We'll, have it, we'll turn it around this afternoon. Excellent. Thanks. Barb, you had a question? 
Yeah, um, I have a few. I guess I'll stick to just one for the simplicity of the call. Uh, the last peer-reviewed research I had read was that there is no ability to distinguish uh, the strength of any tornadoes based on rotational velocity on radar. Um, is there other research out there that indicates otherwise? And if not, what kind of training and guidance are you going to give us to help us make that distinction scientifically? Yeah, that's good. That's a really good question, Bob. I, and I, I agree. There isn't, there isn't any um, research that says we can discern the strength based on the rotation on the radar of a tornado. Again, the, you know, the damage strength, the damage, um, the, the, the rating, the damage rating is done based on the damage that's occurred uh, through a survey and that. So, uh, so that does, you know, it's, we can look at very strong rotations, but if it doesn't necessarily do the damage strength that when we do a survey, we don't get those ratings. So there, you're correct. We're not, and, and what we're saying here is that we're not trying to forecast the EF scale uh, strength of tornadoes. We're, what we're trying to do is provide the forecaster with the option to say a little bit more about the storm when they feel confident that this is one of those days or one of those storms spe specifically that they want to heighten the awareness of. And so, um, you know, we're trying to provide guidelines of, of, you know, it's a big day type event that all the indices are pointing toward, uh, you know, uh, high-end uh, tornado likelihood, uh, potential for long-track tornadoes, and those kinds of considerations. But, you know, we fully expect that these tags would be very rarely used. And so that, that we're making them available for those specific days. But it does not necessarily, I mean, you know, we know, I think, when we have those big days and we have the long-track tornadoes, those are the ones that generally are of the higher-end EF scale damage. Uh, and certainly, you have that kind of day and you have a tornado moving into a metropolitan area, you're going to get a lot more damage uh, and potential for loss of life uh, in those events. So all we're doing is providing this tool for the forecaster. We, I agree with you totally. We can't forecast EF scale, you know, in our warnings. Uh, we... we but the only way we, we do it is implied by those specific other variables like the environment and the signatures that you're seeing on the radar, and, and the forecaster will then have the option to add the tag on that. You're not required to add that tag, but if you feel comfortable about that particular situation, you can add that tag, either considerable, and, then if, it's, and if you have a considerable type of storm that's moving in a metropolitan area, you might want to go to a catastrophic and do a tornado emergency if you feel, feel that's warranted. So. Yeah, uh, that, we're not trying to forecast the F scale. Hey, Pete. Yes. This is uh, Ken here in Wichita, and uh, I have a forecaster here that uh, she was on during the April 14th event, was one of the main warning forecasters. If uh, you would like her to speak to some of those concerns that Barb has. If she'd like to. We're here. All right. Um, this is Gerilyn in Wichita. It's, uh, Hannah's can't really forecast and strength, but if you're trying to look, no, uh, put it with a number scale, but it is, as meteorologists were trained, it's very easy to tell on radar signature if we're expecting a wedge coming through versus a weaker spin-up, and that is really what I felt was the take-home from it or the difference in what I could offer and provide to my customers as with the different tags. I could supply that this is a big tornado, this one is a bigger concern um, versus one that is less, and that is easily identifiable, or maybe not just easy, but more easily identifiable via just velocity. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and you know, and often the question people ask me is that, you know, the uh, Joplin tornado, uh, uh, you know, I strongly feel that, that the way that situation evolved, that it would, have been, it would have been almost impossible for me to have decided that I should have issued a, a catastrophic or a considerable even uh, for, that, for that event. I mean, the way that developed and the way that evolved. I mean, they had a tornado warning out, and, and under IBW, you probably would have just had a tornado warning out. But as we know, a lot of people died that day, uh, and it was, you know, it was a, a major catastrophic event. But, you know, we didn't have, a, the warning forecaster doesn't have the confidence to use that. You don't use that. And, and, and that's, you know, we're not, it's not penalty for not using it. It's just when you do know or you, you feel confident 
uh, more confident anyway, and you're never fully confident, but you feel more confident that uh, that you there may be considerable damage or catastrophic event, uh, then you have that option. So. Hey, this is, this this is our, uh, uh, Dave Pueblo. Um, could you speak to and help the field understand why we're talking about this in mid-December and need an answer within two weeks during uh, peak leave? Yeah, I, I and I... You know, I don't, I don't feel great about having to do this right now, uh, but we are because um, we just completed, you know, uh, I and I with, with the union, and if we're going to implement this by April first, we need to get a 90-day service change notice out to our partners, and so 90 days is January first, uh, so. You know, we're we're going to tr we're trying hard to get to that. If we can't get the lot meetings done, we'll we'll issue this change notice as soon afterwards, and we may need to push the start date, depending on what headquarters tells us about whether or not we can get an exception or something, and and put the change out a little bit shorter than is normally required. But so that's why we're doing the, these webinars. That's why we're asking if you could, um, you know, make an informed decision by the end of the month. We will then know which offices will be participating. We can we can draft this change notice and get it out in a 90-day time frame uh, on that. So as, as Mike said, we already heard from one or two offices uh, already that they won't be able to complete this, but if we can get it done immediately after the new year, that probably would work for us still, and maybe we can still start on April 1st on that. If we had made a, if we had completed our our um, I and I, you know, a month earlier or so, we would have had a little more time to work with here. But uh, uh, that, you know, this is just the way it came out. And uh, so, you know, I apologize for rushing here, but I think we have this opportunity, and we'll shoot for the 90-day advance notice on that. And this okay. is Bismarck with a question. Yeah, Bismarck, go ahead. Uh, if you have a situation where you have lower confidence in. Uh, considerable impacts, uh, you issue a tornado warning and then say 10 minutes after the warning is issued you have spotter and law enforcement confirmation of a large tornado. Uh, it's taking a turn towards a highly populated area. Is there a vehicle through the, uh, the SVSs, the uh, follow-up statements, to present um, that type of uh, information, even though it wouldn't have been in the initial warning? Yeah, Bismarck, there certainly is. All of the tags that are present in the tornado warning uh, follow on with the severe weather statement and are available through the template as such. So, And in fact, we had that happen on April 14th on a couple of the storms that happened in Wichita's area where a tornado warning went out. They highlighted it as a, uh, a significant, which is now what we call considerable, uh, tag in a follow-up SVS. Yeah, so you can upgrade or downgrade in the SPS using those tags. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Sure. This is Louisville with a question. Yeah. Yeah, Louisville. Okay. Hey, uh, in the Ohio Valley, we get a lot of QLCS tornadoes, uh, you know, brief spin-ups associated with mesovortices and whatnot. Um, I know when there was first talk of this, there was a few... Um, uh, you know, options where you could mention, you know, brief spin-up tornadoes or or something along those lines. Has there been any thought of, with that, or maybe is that down the road in the future? That That's actually contained. The, that's what that tornado possible tag within the severe thunderstorm warning gives you an option to use. Um, there's certainly the option of issuing tornado warnings for those types of, of signatures as well. Um, again, it all kind of relates down to risk. kind of relates down to risk. Your okay, sorry, I got my voice came back and I didn't, it freaked me out there. It all kind of comes down to risk management, and, and it's a tool that you as a warning forecaster have in your arsenal. Today, you have two options. You either issue a tornado warning or you say nothing about it. In the IBW world, you have three options. You can say nothing about it. You can issue a tornado warning. You can highlight it with the tornado possible tag within the severe thunderstorm warning and watch for evolving signatures. Okay, thanks. This is Omaha. We have a question. Sure, Omaha. Yeah, we're curious about the, the PathCast. We went through some training a couple of years ago that talked about uh, limiting the use of PathCast uh, in, in warnings due to uh, findings in a service assessment that said that people were, you know, waiting for the exact time, and then when it didn't hit them at that time, they come out of their basement and things like that. So um, this seems to be emphasizing the PathCast. I was curious about that. 
Yeah, that's 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 correct. Uh, the the key, I think, to the pathcast is uh, is a good storm track. You know, if you if you just use the default uh, extrapolation on that, your pathcast. Uh, you know, the, especially with a supercell, you may have you know a turning uh, motion uh, instead of a straight line uh, type thing. So. Um, so anyway, back in yeah, one of the service assessment, I, I don't know which one it was, but they we had, uh, you know, the, basically the the storm was projected to to go in one direction, and it actually, you know, it would it it, it affected other cities that weren't even mentioned in the pathcast, um, and so um, you know that was a finding that was to, to de-emphasize that. But then when we you know this last year when we did these focus groups it was one of the one of the key items that they were asking for is tell me when it's going to get here. And they weren't too uh, concerned about accurate timing. They just wanted an idea of, where, of, of whether, when it's going to get to them. So, so I think what we'd want to do here, I mean, the PathCast is an option, and, and I think it's available for use when we have, you know, let's say you have a strong feature like a good circulation that you want to track, and if you're taking into account, which we'll, we'll We'll talk about in the training uh, the storm motion, you know, things like bunkers, storm motion uh, vectors, and that kind of thing. If you can take that into account, you can get a, a better, a better uh, motion vector for the feature, and that will result in a better path cast. But again, you don't have to use the path cast. We're strongly encouraging it for these features when you're using these higher end tags, in particular. But otherwise, you know, you know, it's still up to you to decide how the best describe and, and, you know, the, the cities in the path and the, and the path cast. And, and does the cities in the path appear also with the path cast, or is that? They can. And they within, can, yeah. Within those templates, they sure can. Cities in the, in the polygon, I mean, yeah. yeah. Another, another um, discrepancy I think folks will recognize is that a few years back when we, you know, in 2007, I think when we started the polygons, we talked about not worrying about county boundaries. Um, but we've learned, of course, that, and I think uh, most, most folks already know this from years of trying to do this and talking to their own, their own emergency managers and media, but we, you know, we still have warning systems like weather radio and, and county siren systems that work off the county. Uh, their policies are based on county warnings. So we issue tornado warnings that touch a county. Uh, we're, at, we're, in a sense, setting off sirens on, from weather radio from, from local emergency managers that are required to, to set off the sirens when a tornado warning touches their county on that. So we need to go back and rethink how we issue these polygons and include consideration of county boundaries because of these alert systems that still exist in the county-based world and that. So that's, a, that's also another one of these where some kind of reversing course a little bit so that we can do a better job in trying to reduce the number of warnings that touch a county for the same event, if we consider the county boundaries, we can probably reduce the perceived false alarm that, that occurs when there's so many different warnings touching a county. So, other questions? E? Yeah. E? This is Brian Smith. Hi, Brian. I just, just on the same note, you know, you get uh, from the customer feedback that they want, like, path cast. Um, and yet, you know, a lot of those customers and emergency managers want a lot of things, but are we really capable of producing what they really want? That's what I really question with all this. I think, Brian, the answer to that question is if you don't want to provide it to them, or we don't as a weather service, they will go find somebody who will. We are the nation's preeminent weather service. We have information. We're not perfect, but we do have information. And if we have the information, and as Pete was talking about, the whole notion of going forward in year two with a little bit more emphasis on the path cast or on those types of storms when there's a very distinct feature that the warning forecaster is tracking. I've been in the warning seat in several offices, and I can think of very many days when there were very distinct features, when there were very fuzzy features. And the way that our Warn Gen team has set it up is to give you guys all the tools to use what you can. But if you have information that can be helpful in an every single one of those focus groups that we conducted in those five offices and at the clicker surveys at both state emergency management conferences, 
those six themes that we talked about, confidence, timing, duration, location, were all consistent from every group independently. And so we want to place an emphasis from at least a regional policy perspective that if you've got the confidence to tell people when you think it might get there, about what time, do it. Yeah, some some of the, um, sorry to interrupt, Mike, but some of the, some of the AMs told us that if we didn't provide it, they were, they were trying to get it from either a local media outlet that was drawing these lines on their screens to try to show arrival times. You know, you know some of these uh, media out markets, they list all kinds of times on the screen, and then they keep changing it. Um, or they were using, um, you know, accessing um, radar algorithm data on websites. And, I, you know, I don't know if I would trust a, uh, um, you know, a... Uh, motion vector from the radar from the radar algorithms with you know even identifying the centroid sometimes is, is issue so um, See, yeah this, this is not a matter of competition you know they can try to find it but it that information may be wrong that the that the other that maybe the other outlets would provide this is a matter of skill and, and being having the skill of being able to provide that that information yeah, Brian, Pete's, Pete's phone is ringing there. That's all right. Um, all points that are duly noted. And, you know, one of the things that, that I think that both Pete and I would want to emphasize from the standpoint of region's perspective of IBW in year two, uh, these are tools that we want IBW offices to have. Uh, we want your warning forecaster to have every tool at his or her disposal to tell somebody in the path of a storm whatever information they feel confident in telling them. Um, it isn't a matter of competition, but... The interesting thing is, from all of this work that Wexham has done, and just to share with you all a very short anecdotal story of what they did, uh, a lot of their work has been in the tropical world, and they've worked with a lot of uh, emergency managers along the east coast of the United States. They would go sit in an EOC and watch an emergency manager. They'd first interview that person and ask him what they use, and then they would sit and watch. Nine times out of ten, they're not using weather service information to make decisions. That's just a fact of life. Uh, they do shop around, and I, as we as we worked on this year two proposal, I, I think that the important thing to remember with regards to an issue like path casts and warnings is, I'd much rather that that emergency manager get the best information he or she can from the world's preeminent weather service, than have them go shop for it and take their chances. Um, it won't answer this question necessarily of whether it's a great idea or a grand idea or a bad idea. Uh, that I think sits in the mind of the warning forecaster. That's why the warning forecaster is empowered to make those big decisions when they sit in that chair. But we really want to try to emphasize that from everything we're hearing from our social science partners that are helping us interview these people, they're looking for information and they're hoping we can provide it. Hey, Mike, this is St. Louis. Yeah, St. Louis. Yeah, if I could offer an observation on the small number of storms we had last year. For the offices that are thinking about going into this, obviously this uh, requires, um, the IBW process requires another, another level of thinking for the warning forecaster. Um, there's two things that we observed last year. Well, one thing especially, the observed versus radar indicated. Um, for years, our muscle memory has been to go with the warn gen templates as they are, which is usually radar indicated. But the IBW process, one of the things is confidence, and confidence is based on what's observed. So you kind of got to fight your muscle memory a little bit and remember um, to use the observed tag when you're starting to get verification that your warning is actually occurring. Um, the other thing, obviously, there's, a, there's another level of um, complexity added to the warning process. Tornado warning is now not necessarily good enough. You've got to determine if you need to do something else. I'm not saying these are bad things. I'm just saying these are things that an office needs to think about. And I do want to say that the training we had last year was excellent. Um, it really gives an office a very good perspective on the process about what will occur, about things that the warning forecaster needs to think about. It is very well done, and um, it's just it's just a really good primer for getting ready to go with the IBW. All right, thanks. 
Are there other thoughts, uh, questions? And just because they don't come up on this call doesn't mean that either Pete or I aren't available at any time to talk with anybody uh, or any of the five other other offices. And, and certainly uh, they probably have the better testimonial than, uh, than we do because they actually issued the warnings last year. Hey, uh, guys, this is Ken at Wichita. And I guess I just wanted to add uh, to one thing to this call, just like I did last week. You know, we, we had a pretty decent outbreak of tornadoes on the 14th where we had 24 of them. And then on the 19th of May, we had a, a bunch of uh, landspout type deals where we had, I think, nine or ten of them. And a couple of them grew up scale into supercells and what have you. And it was a complicated situation. But I guess in all that, really for us, I don't feel, and the forecasters here, we, you know, we've been talking about this, not really much changed over the – we just are really putting – what we think now into the warnings. I think every one of us that sat behind the radar has thought when we're looking at something and we, we know we're in an environment that's favorable for, for something bad, we see something on our radar and go, oh, wow, that looks bad. Well, you know, now it is and we can say it is. And, and I, I just want to caution everyone not to overcomplicate this. It really is a keep it simple, stupid type of thing. Um, you know, we can split hairs over, over many things with this, but I think if we just keep it simple, um, it's pretty, uh, I think it's pretty straightforward, and, and I think that the data backs it up that we can do this. So um, that's my comment. All right. Thanks, Ken. Any last-minute questions, thoughts, or comments? Hey, Mike. This is uh, Scott in Goodland. Yes, Scott. Uh, firstly, I guess... Uh, to have this implemented so quickly uh, after the service assessment, I think, is a testament. I think most of us agree that the warning uh, procedures, if not broken, could certainly be improved. And for our agency to do something within a year, I think, is saying something. That, that it's very good that we're at least trying something different. And um, if this gets more people to take action, and I have my doubts and my skepticism whether a tag will actually do that, but if it will, I'm willing to try that. Now, here's my question. Is there going to be pressure put on offices that are served by one media market to fall in line if one of the other offices is going? In other words, if Dodge City decides to implement this and we decide not to and we're served by the same media market, Seems like there's a lot of inconsistency there, and I'd like your thoughts on that. Well, I think we had we sort of had that in Kansas this last year, didn't we? Uh, a little bit, but you know the important thing here. I want to make sure this is. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Pete. That this decision is is done to the local office team process at every office. That's where the decision lies. There's no pressure from central region headquarters to participate. There's no pressure from outside sources. But I think these are things you ought to be talking about when you're doing your local office team meetings, who you serve and who your offices serve, who your backup offices serve. Uh, because you may opt to not be an IBW office, but the office you serve as a primary backup for may very well be. These are questions that all of you can have, and, and, and granted the, the time frame is not the ideal time frame, and we know that. Uh, but these are the types of things I think you all should be considering in your local office team meetings, the impacts to your customer. And that's a really great thing to think about because, really, we're here to serve people. Uh, and the more we keep our mindset in that context, uh, I think the better uh, those types of decisions get made. Okay, well, hearing, I guess, no other further questions or comments. We have, a, we have a question out here in Hastings. Uh, uh, is, is there an option for more than one source? Because if you've got more than one source, people might be more likely to take action. Within the templates, you have options to select spotter, law enforcement, this and that and the other. There's nothing that precludes you from putting that in if you feel that it adds value to the warning. Do, do we have an option to click more than, more than one of those? Not in AWIPS 1. There's a lot more flexibility in AWIPS 2 uh, to do things like text uh, um, concatenation, things of that nature, fuzzy logic that allows you to not inadvertently select radar indicated and spotter reported. Um, AWIPS 1 has a lot of limitations, as we found out from scripting the templates in year one. 
Um, and Phil and Evan, if, if they're on the call, could, could attest to that. But um, there's nothing that precludes you from putting anything in a warning that adds value to your customer. Nothing at all. I don't believe you can select two options at once in AWIPS 1 and get them to concatenate. I do not believe that's a function that they were able to, uh, to put together. You can edit it. Uh, in AWIPS 2, um, there's a lot more flexibility for things like concatenation and fuzzy logic. Okay, thanks. This is Omaha again. We have one more question. Okay. Sure. Um, that final report, is that going to be released to everybody before we, uh, before we vote or um, no? No. Uh, it, we, we won't probably see it until the end of the month. Pete and I have seen the basic gist of what Wexham's been working towards. Uh, in fact, they asked for our internal perceptions on the same questions that they're rating our, our uh, feedback on within this matrix of things. Uh, and it focuses on those six key areas. And really, what, we, what we've learned from those focus groups and things really focuses on some key areas that we could do a little bit better job of highlighting on, things such as confidence, things such as timing uh, and duration. Uh, those were three of the ones, as I recall, that really kind of stood out as you really maybe didn't quite get to these as deeply as you wanted to, uh, but you got at, at other elements with other pieces of IBW. Basically, what they're trying to do is to validate, more than anything, the do no harm clause. And from everything that's there that we've seen, uh, that they've shared with us, that we've talked about, um, we definitely aren't doing harm. Uh, we're adding value in certain areas that decision makers need this type of information. So while the timing would be better to have it out before you all were discussing this, um, no one here at Central Region Headquarters would throw their WFOs under the bus and give them something that wasn't uh, at least as good at, if not better, than what we've been running for years. Well, you know, what we presented today is the bulk of what is in that report on that. So you know, I think the final, um, you know, the, the, the matrix uh, um, validation part between the, you know, the, the six items that were discovered and the, uh, and the three uh, outcome areas of risk characterization, communication, and management, you know, I don't, we don't have that in front of us to show right now, but uh, but most of the you know the things that we presented today are, are out of, will be in that report and all the major you know findings that we learned from year one on that. So um, we will you know we'll come back in January and you know with the final report and refresh this this webinar with the details from that. But I don't think you know I really don't think there's anything missing that you need that we didn't present uh, today. Uh, to help you make your decision uh, in the lot process. Well, I guess we'll wrap up here. And again, if you want to send us uh, questions, oh, someone else? Is that me echoing back? Okay. So uh, it's, feel free to send us questions um, uh, if you have anything, or call us. Uh, we're glad to answer any additional questions. Um, and, um, you know, hopefully we can, you know, the steward and the manager can get together and uh, have a lot uh, before the end of the month. That would be preferred. And we can uh, then get a change notice out about the offices participating and, and get started on April 1st as our target date. So thank you, everyone, for coming today. We have it recorded. Uh, and I'll provide a link out to the offices uh, once we get that loaded up on the MetDAT and uh, available for download.